So hello, my name is Mike Brulison. I'm a professor of physics at Oglethorpe University in Atlanta. And I am happy to be here today to share with you uh, a little bit about using Newton's law of gravitation, um, but to investigate tidal forces. So <clears throat> we all know Newton's law of universal gravitation, which I'm uh, showing here. If we have a pair of masses, M1 and M2, and their centers are separated by some distance r. There are gravitational forces that act, equal forces that act on those two objects given by Newton's law of gravitation. But the thing we wanna to investigate today is tidal forces. And so in just a second, I'll explain sort of how the tidal force is actually defined, but let's look at the physical origin of the tidal forces first. So if we consider the case of the earth, tidal forces are much more general than this, by the way, but the tidal force uh, and the effect of that tidal force when we're talking about the earth is one that's fairly obvious, uh, especially if you've ever been to the beach, uh, to the shore, um, then you know that there are a couple of high tides each day and a couple of low tides. And so we'll see sort of where that comes from. And then near the end of the presentation today, um, we'll talk a little bit about how tidal forces act in some other situations other than the earth. Newton's law of gravitation, we're all familiar with this, that if we have a pair of masses, M1 and M2, and their centers are separated by some distance r, that there will be equal and opposite gravitational forces that act on those two objects. Um, and they'll be given by Newton's law of gravitation that we see here. So today what we wanna do though is use Newton's law of gravitation um, as our starting point and try to see what the origin of tidal forces are. Now, tidal forces, I'll define exactly how the tidal force is, is, uh, is defined how we, how we calculate it and how we define it uh, in a minute. But we can start to see where it originates from by just looking at um, the forces that act at various points um, for objects that might be on the surface of the earth. And I wanna just say that um, as we go along, um, we'll uh, a little bit later look at some other tidal forces that exist in other situations, but uh, the tidal force acting um, on the earth due to the moon uh, is one that's common uh, to us because if you've been to the beach, you know there are a couple of high tides every 24 hours and a couple of low tides every 24 hours. So if we, um, if we look at the uh, gravitational force that would act on a mass that might be placed at point A, first of all, on the surface of the earth, and over to the right here, we have the moon. Well, the force at that point will be G, the mass of the moon, capital M here, whatever the mass is that we're looking at at point A, and then divided by the square of the distance between those two points. So the radius of the earth here, I'm taking to be capital R. And since the distance between the center of the earth and the moon is little r, the distance from A to the moon is little r minus capital R, and that gets squared. And if we do the similar thing at point B on the opposite side of the earth, then we get the force FB, where now it's a little bit larger distance, little r plus capital R in the denominator. And then finally, the force that would act on a mass small m if it were located at the center of the earth is given by the middle expression, what I've called F center. So G capital M little m over R squared, okay? And because of the different size of those three denominators, you can see that the gravitational force at A is larger, the gravitational force at B is smaller, and then the gravitational force at the center of the earth would be intermediate between those two. So for these next couple of slides, I've reproduced that diagram at the top just so we can keep track of what I'm referring to as point A and point B and so on. Now, because the radius of the earth is very small compared with the distance between the earth and the moon, the diagrams are obviously not to scale here. Um, what that means is that in the denominators of our two expressions for the force at B and the force at A, if we factor an R squared out of that denominator, then we get the uh, expression that, that we see in the middle here. Um, so G capital M little m over R squared, but then times this one plus little, uh, capital R rather over little r to the minus two power. And because sm uh, capital R here is small compared with uh, little r, uh, that ratio is small then we can use the binomial approximation 
for this factor to the minus two here. And what we get is one minus two capital R over little r, plus higher order terms that are gonna be very small. So we're gonna ignore those higher order terms. Doing the same thing at point A, uh, where we have a slightly different denominator, but the same process, factor out a little r squared, use the binomial approximation. Uh, the force at A is approximately G capital M little m over r squared, and then times one plus two capital R over little r. And again, higher order terms that we will uh, neglect for right now. So these are approximate expressions for the forces at B and A, but they are extremely good approximations because the moon is so far away compared with the radius of the earth. So now let's define what the tidal force actually is. Um, as it is commonly used, um, the tidal force is the difference between the force at a particular point and the force at the center of mass of the Earth. And of course, when we talk about objects other than the Earth, it'll be the force at the center of mass of whatever that other object is. So in this case of the Earth, the tidal force at A over on the right-hand side there um, the first term that you see, that's the approximate form for the uh, gravitational force at A that we just um, found on the previous slide. And then we're subtracting off the gravitational force that acts at the center of mass of the Earth. That's the G capital M little m over R squared term. And when we take that difference, two of those terms cancel each other out. And what we're left with, voila, is two capital G capital M little m capital R, which you remember is the radius of the Earth, divided by the cube of the distance between uh, the Earth and the Moon, the centers of the Earth and the Moon. And if we likewise do the same thing at point B, uh, the only difference being that sign inside the parenthesis there, again, we get two terms that cancel each other, and in this case, the force is minus two capital G, the capital M, little m, uh, capital R over R cubed. So these are the tidal forces then that we have at points A and B. And notice that they have opposite sign, okay? Uh, the one at A is positive and the one at B is, po at, uh, B is negative rather. So what I'm showing here then is what those tidal forces are. And so the one at A uh, being positive points toward the moon, uh, the one over here at B being negative points away from the moon. And so um, if we were to have a test mass, a little mass of some sort located at point A, it would experience this extra little bit of force to the right. And a similar mass placed at point B would experience a little bit of a extra force, but to the left in the opposite direction. Now, of course, you'll notice that what we've done here is we've taken a very simple case where the two points that we've looked at, A and B, are right on the line that connects the centers of the Earth and the Moon. In a second, we'll see how that generalizes. And in fact, we can begin to do that now. So I've chosen a few points here um, on the Earth, including the center of the Earth, of course, but I've chosen a few different points. Um, the two that we just looked at, um, point A, which is here, and point B, which is over here, but I've picked a few points that are um, not on that line as well. And of course, each of these gravitational forces is pointing directly toward the moon, because that's the force that we're looking at here. And so you see the orientation and the relative size of the gravitational force at various points on the surface of the Earth. Now, if we had the time, we could go through the little vector calculation forces are vectors, remember, so that when you take the sum or the difference of them, they must be added or subtracted as vectors. We could do the vector uh, subtraction to find what the, gravitation, the uh, tidal force is at each of these points. I'm going to save us the uh, agony of doing that and just indicate that when you carry out that procedure, the tidal force if we, as usual, use a little set of uh, unit vectors, let's take I to be along the line that joins the Earth to the moon, and we'll take J to be a unit vector along the y-axis pointing perpendicular to that line between the Earth and the moon. And 
let's let theta here describe the point on the surface of the Earth that we're located at. So theta equals zero would be our friend point A from earlier. And theta equal to 180 degrees over here would be point B. And then any other point that we might want to look at on the surface. So when you carry out that vector subtraction, and it's not difficult, folks, it just is a little bit time consuming. Um, the tidal force turns out to be at any point on the Earth's surface. Uh, the same expression that we saw before, two capital G, uh, big M, little m, capital R over R cubed, times the cosine theta, that's the x component of each of these tidal forces. And then uh, the y component of each of those tidal forces is the same thing, but without the factor of two notice, it's missing here, and then times sine of theta. So these are the x and y components of these forces, which I've drawn in at each of those points. The interesting thing is we saw earlier that you know point A uh, experiences a tidal force to the right, and point B experiences a similar tidal force to the left. But not notice these two points um, that are on what we've defined as our y-axis. Tidal force here actually turns out to be in, pointing in toward the center of the Earth, and likewise down here, in toward the center of the Earth. So if you think about the combined effect of all of these forces at all of these points on the surface, there's a tendency for uh, anything that is able to move in response to these forces to be elongated along the axis pointing toward the moon and to be compressed somewhat along the direction that's perpendicular to that line that uh, joins the Earth to the moon. Okay. Now, um, I just wanted to stick one slide in to keep uh, us aware of the fact that up above, we got uh, the tidal force by making an approximation. You remember we did the binomial approximation um, for those distances that appeared in the denominators of our two expressions. There's actually a much more elegant way to do this, and maybe a way that would be more familiar and more comfortable to many of you. And that is that if we were to start with Newton's law of gravitation, uh, shown at the top here, and that is, remember, the force that's acting at the center of the Earth, we could differentiate that expression for the force with respect to r. And you know, taking the derivative of g capital M little m over r squared, we would get minus 2g capital M little m over r cubed. And the thing to note is that by um, approaching the tidal force this way, df right, is the tidal force. It is the change in tidal force between two points, OK? And those two points would be points that are separated by a distance dr okay, from each other. So at what we called point A up here originally, okay, and we'll still refer to it that way, dr, the, the difference in uh, the r value is minus capital R because we've moved from here, okay, from the center of the earth, this direction. Okay, we've decreased the radius by an amount capital R. And so if we uh, take dr here, in this case to be negative r, move that over to the right-hand side, there's our tidal force, that we same force that we found before by the approximate method, here obtained by taking the derivative. Likewise, at point b, over on this side of the Earth, dr is plus r, because from the center we've moved an additional distance, we've added a distance, capital R, and so when we multiply the right-hand side here by capital R, we get our tidal force at B of negative 2GMM capital R over little r cubed. So this is perhaps, uh, this method perhaps is more, a little bit more elegant. Uh, always nice to use calculus when you can. Uh, but either way, uh, we arrive at the same expression for the tidal force at those two points. Now, the next thing I'd like to uh, show you is that the same size tidal force can arise for a variety of different reasons. So what I've done here is constructed a graph that shows just an inverse, the inverse square force of gravity, so GMM over R squared, Newton's law of gravitation. And let's suppose we want to look at a tidal force of a particular size. Now, keep in mind how we define tidal force. It's the difference between the gravitational force at two points. So let's say we want to look at a tidal force that's this big, okay, corresponding to two 
vertical uh, divisions on my graph. Well, on this part of our uh, graph of Newton's law of gravitation, these would be the two points that are separated by that amount, right? And notice that they are very close to each other, right? They're not separated by very much distance horizontally. Whereas if we look for the same size tidal force down here at the bottom part of the graph, again, two units vertically, so that we're comparing equal size tidal forces, that force would correspond to this point and this point way over here. So this would be the same tidal force, but this corresponds to an object or to two points that are much, much farther apart from one another. So the bottom line here is that we can get the same tidal force for a small object that's very near to whatever's producing the tidal force, or by looking at a very large object where the points on the surface are separated by a large distance that is very far away from the source of the tidal force. So there sometimes is a misconception that the tidal force is only large if you're near you know, whatever the object is that's producing that tidal force. And that need not be the case. Tidal forces can still be significant and can be large, even when we're far away, way out here, as long as the object that we're looking at is large, is physically large, okay? Now, a lot of numbers here, but what we wanna uh, take a look at is just uh, the comparison in the sizes of some tidal forces and also a uh, comparison of the size of the gravitational forces. So just so we're all on the same page with regard to what this table is showing, what I'm calling the source object is the thing that is producing the tidal force. The affected object is the object that the tidal force is acting upon. And then the two columns on the right here are, we'll look at what the tidal force per unit mass is, and also though what the gravitational force per unit mass is. Okay, so let's consider three cases. Um, the, the familiar one that we've been talking about, the moon produces a tidal force on the earth. So we've got the mass here of the moon, we've got the radius of the earth, the distance between the earth and the moon, those are the things that we need in order to be able to calculate the tidal force. And so when we calculate this force per unit mass, we get uh, 1.1 times 10 to the minus six, okay? Now, the Earth, though, produces a tidal force on the moon as well. Right? So if we look at that, um, Earth has a much larger mass. The moon, though, has a smaller radius, but they're separated by the same distance, of course. And so the tidal force that the Earth exerts on the moon, you'll notice, is about 20 times bigger than the tidal force that the moon exerts on the Earth. And we'll see in a, uh, shortly what the consequence of that has been in terms of how the uh, solar system and more particularly how the earth moon system has evolved over time. Finally, because of what we're gonna look at on the next slide, I wanted to also um, go ahead and calculate how much of a tidal force does the sun produce acting on the earth? So the sun's got a whopping big mass, a million times bigger than the earth's. And, uh, Here's the size of the Earth again, the separation between the Earth and the Sun. And so the tidal force that the Sun produces on the Earth is this value that you see here, five times 10 to the minus seven. If you compare it with the Moon's tidal force on the Earth, so the top uh, column, or the top row rather, and the bottom row here, you'll notice the Sun's uh, tidal force rather is about half of the Moon's tidal force. Keep that in mind when we look at the next slide. This last column, just wanna mention it briefly. This is not the tidal force, but rather just the pure gravitational force, Newton's law of gravitation um, that would act on a unit mass. And notice that um, the moon's gravitational effect, 3.3 3 .3 times 10 to the minus five. Um, and down here in the last row, the sun's gravitational effect though on something on the surface of the earth, five times 10 to the minus three. So this, even though the sun's gravitational force is nearly 200 times stronger than the moon's, the moon's tidal force is twice as big as the sun's tidal force. Okay, so 
tidal forces, because they depend on the cube of the distance, and the gravitational force itself depends only on the square of the distance, that's what accounts for this, uh, this difference between these two uh, right-hand columns here. So if we're purely talking about gravitational force, yeah, the sun's the more important thing. But if we're talking about tidal forces, the moon turns out to be the more important of the two. Now, keeping in mind that both the sun and the moon exert tidal forces on the earth, that gives rise to two sort of extreme cases for tides that actually occur. So what we're showing here is uh, the Earth, the Moon over here, and the Sun. Uh, if you think about this for a second, you realize this would be a full Moon, okay? Because the, from the Earth, we would see the entire illuminated hemisphere of the Moon. And because the Moon pulls and exerts a tidal force on the Earth, causing an elongation along that axis, and so does the Sun, although the Sun's tidal force is weaker, it would also be producing a tidal force that would elongate things along that axis. At a new moon or a full moon, we can do it either way, right? Because this would be new moon here. If I switch back to here, that's full moon. In either case, the sun, earth, and moon are all along the same line. And so we get abnormally large high tides and we get abnormally small low tides. Okay, because the tidal effects of the moon and sun are, are adding together, they're complementing one another. Now, those are called spring tides. If we look at the opposite extreme, when the sun, moon, and earth are arranged this way, basically at right angles to one another, and this would occur when from the earth, we see a half moon, we would see half the moon's disk illuminated and half of it dark. So this is called first quarter. Well, now the moon is trying to elongate uh, things along this axis by its tidal force, but the sun is working against that by trying to elongate things along this perpendicular axis. The moon is still the more important one, as we saw on the table a few minutes ago, because the moon's tidal force is larger, but because the sun and the moon are sort of working against each other in this case, in terms of producing the, the tidal forces, we get unusually small high tides and likewise unusually small uh, low tides. So there's, there's less of a tidal range when the moon is in first quarter or third quarter, okay, either way. And there are larger tides between high tide and low tide um, when we're at full moon or at new moon. Those are the spring tides. So spring tides and neap tides can both be understood just by looking at the um, how the uh, tidal forces of the sun and the moon add to each other. Okay, now finally, um, a few examples of tidal forces and their consequences um, elsewhere, besides in the case of uh, the, the Earth and the moon. So one of the moons of Jupiter, um, it's one of the, the four moons that Galileo discovered back in 1610, when he first turned a telescope, to the sky. Io is one of those four moons, and it's actually of those four large moons that Galileo discovered. Um, it is the one that is closest to Jupiter. Uh, it does turn out that there is an, a smaller moon that's a little bit closer still, but of the large moons, um, Io is the closest. And so we can use what we know about Newton's law of gravitation, but also uh, the result that we've derived for tidal forces to understand um, what's called tidal flexing in the case of Io. So um, let's look at the calculation, then I'll explain what the effect of that is. So we're gonna calculate for Io two things. What's the acceleration due to uh, Io's gravitation, its own gravitational field? Newton's law of gravitation, right? G times the mass of that moon divided by the square of its radius. And we get 1.8 meters per second squared. So if you were gonna drop something on uh, Io, that's what you'd use for little g, the rate at which things would accelerate toward the surface. Now let's calculate the acceleration though due to the tidal force of Jupiter. Since Io's just right close to Jupiter, there will be a tidal acceleration. And here's our expression again for the tidal acceleration. 
when you put in the mass of Jupiter, the radius of Io, the size of Io's orbit around Jupiter, you get 0 0.0062 meters per second squared. Now, I'll grant you that seems pretty small compared to this. It is. It turns out to be about 0.3%. And you may say, well, 0.3%, that's not that big a deal. doesn't matter that much. Just for comparison, we'll come back to this in a minute. Just for comparison, let's do the same calculation for the Earth. So acceleration due to self-gravitation, everybody's seen this a few times, g, mass of the Earth over radius of the Earth squared, and of course we get 9.8 meters per second squared. If we calculate the acceleration due to the tidal force of the moon acting on the Earth, putting in mass of the moon and so on, we get 1.1 times 10 to the negative six meters per second squared. That ratio is 0.00001%. So you, although this 0.3% up here might've seemed small, you can see that it is really quite large, relatively speaking, it's way more there's way more tidal effect on Io than there is tidal effect on the Earth. Now, the consequence of this is that as Io orbits around Jupiter, it is stretched and compressed okay, by this really, as we've tried to argue here, quite large tidal force. And that flexing causes heat. And that heat is one of the things that keeps the interior of Io in a molten state. And this is the reason that um, we see volcanoes taking place um, on the surface of Io. Um, if it were not flexed by these tidal forces as it orbited, uh, there might still be some volcanism. I'm not saying that there wouldn't be, but it probably would not be as extensive as it is. And so the outer part of the solar system, of course, very cold out there, far from the sun and so on. But this tidal flexing is adding some heat constantly to the interior of the planet as it gets stretched and compressed and stretched and compressed. Um, another uh, thing that we can understand pretty easily um, is that these tidal forces that we're talking about actually change the orbital dynamics of objects. They change how, how objects uh, not only orbit, but also how they rotate. And let's see if we can understand this. It's actually, at least qualitatively, it's pretty easy to understand. So what I'm showing in the diagram, and then we'll look at the text over here. So here's the Earth with its tidal bulges, okay? And the moon over here, which is causing those. Now the Earth is rotating, right, on its axis. So rotating in this direction, let's say. Well. The thing is that Earth's rotation period, 24 hours, is a lot shorter than the moon's orbital period, which is a month, right? It takes a month for the moon to make one trip around the Earth, but it only takes 24 hours for the Earth to rotate once. So what that means is the friction between the, the Earth's oceans and the surface, the solid surface of the Earth, as the Earth rotates, it drags that tidal bulge with it a little bit. And so you'll notice this tidal bulge does not point directly toward the moon. It's off at an angle like this as the Earth's rotation carries it around. So this bulge being a little bit closer to the moon is gonna have a stronger gravitational force acting on it. I'm calling that the force on the leading edge, okay? And this tidal bulge being, far, being farther from uh, the moon uh, has a somewhat smaller gravitational force acting on it that we're calling F lag. Because these forces have different sizes, there is a torque that acts on uh, the Earth, therefore. And that torque, you'll notice, this force is bigger, right, than this one over here. So that torque is in the clockwise direction, which is against the direction that the Earth is actually orbiting, uh, or rotating, I should say, on its axis. So that torque is slowing down over time. It's constantly slowing down the rotation of the Earth. And again, it's a small effect in human time scales, at least. It's slowing down the Earth's rotation by about two milliseconds every century. Now, you might say, well, two milliseconds in a century, that's nothing. But um, over geologic sorts of time scales of millions, 
tens of millions, even billions of years, that two milliseconds per century adds up to a lot. So at earlier times in Earth, in the history of the Earth Moon system, the Earth used to be rotating much more rapidly than it is. And the other uh, consequence of this uh, difference in the, in the tidal forces is this. Don't forget Newton's third law. If this is the force of gravity that the moon exerts on the Earth's tidal bulge, then that tidal bulge exerts an equal and opposite force right along this line on the moon. And likewise, there is a Newton's third law partner to this force here, a little bit smaller, right along this line. If you add those two forces that act on the moon due to the Earth's two tidal bulges, you get a net force that is not quite along the line that joins the moon to the Earth's center. It's slightly ahead, as I've shown here. And what that force that's slightly ahead of the uh, line connecting their centers does is it causes the moon to speed up in its orbit. And in order, as it speeds up, it moves farther away from the Earth. So two things are actually happening, both as a result of these tidal forces. The Earth's rate of rotation is slowing, and the size of the moon's orbit is growing, okay? And it grows by actually about three centimeters per year. The moon gets about three to four centimeters farther away from the Earth every year as a result of this effect here. You might notice, by the way, if you think about those two things together, that what we're really seeing here is conservation of angular momentum. So as the Earth slows down in its rotation, it has less angular momentum. But as the moon speeds up and moves farther away from the Earth, its angular momentum increases. And because the Earth-Moon system is basically isolated, we'll forget about the sun for right now, because it's isolated, we should have the uh, angular momentum of the system should be conserved. And indeed it is, okay. So Earth's rotation rate was much faster and the moon was much closer in the distant past. One last thing about this um, slowing effect um, on the Earth and the change in the size of the moon's orbit, uh, this same effect that is slowing down the Earth in its rotation, remember we saw the tidal force that the Earth exerts on the moon is much larger than the moon's effect on the Earth. So this same slowing effect a long time ago caused the moon's rate of rotation to slow down to the point where now, the moon always keeps the same uh, half, the same hemisphere facing toward the Earth. So we only see the so-called near side of the moon. Um, the, the far side is never visible to us from the Earth, regardless of what the phase of the moon is, because uh, the rate at which the moon rotates is exactly the same as the rate at which it revolves around the Earth. So it keeps the same face pointing toward the Earth as it moves around. That's called synchronous rotation, by the way. Okay, finally, last uh, effect that we'll look at here of the tidal force is what's called the Roche limit. Uh, so the tidal force uh, can become large enough, and I'd ask you to think back to the graph we looked at where we saw that if an object is close to the thing that's producing the tidal force, you can get very large tidal forces. So that force can become large enough to actually disrupt the structure of the object that the tidal force is acting on. Now, the complete treatment of this that Roche did back in 1850 uh, is quite involved mathematically, but we can get a really good estimate by just making a very simple calculation here. Let's ask ourselves, what would be the distance at which the acceleration due to self-gravity of the object uh, becomes equal to, and then inside of that becomes less than, the acceleration due to the tidal force. So you'll recognize these two terms. This is Newton's law of gravitation for finding the acceleration due to self-gravitation of our object. And the right-hand side of our inequality here is the tidal force that the source object is exerting on whatever the object is we're considering. We just wanna know when does that self-gravitation acceleration become less than the tidal acceleration? Now there's lots of ways to manipulate this inequality, but the simplest one is 
let's write these two masses, the mass of the affected object and the mass of the source object, uh, in terms of the densities of those two objects. So treating them both as spheres, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And if we multiply that volume by the density of the object, we will have its mass. So this parenthesis here, that's the mass of the object. This parenthesis over here, that's the mass of the source. A bunch of things cancel out, the, the capital G, the gravitational constant, the 4 thirds, the pi, we can get rid of lots of stuff. And the resulting inequality can be solved for what the separation is between our source object and our affected object when these two accelerations would become the same size. And we end up with an expression of two times the source density over the object density to the one third power, the cube root, multiplied by uh, the radius of the source object. And <clears throat> when you take the cube root of two, you get about 1.26, okay? So don't miss what we're actually trying to see here. When two objects are uh, this far apart or less, okay, given by this expression over here, there will be a larger tidal force trying to pull that object apart than the self-gravitation force that's trying to hold it together, and the object will come apart. Now, when you do the exact calculation, we just made a rough estimate here. When we, if we were to follow the exact method that Roche used, doesn't change things by much. This factor out front turns out to be 2.46 instead of 1.26. So it's about you know, twice as much, but otherwise our estimate here was really quite good. So what are some examples of this? Well, I have two that I'll mention to you to finish uh, our look at tidal forces for today. So back in 1992, um, a comet known as Shoemaker-Levy 9 um, and this is my uh, attempt, artistic attempt at a comet here. Um, this comet, uh, its orbit brought it very close to the planet Jupiter. And on July 8th of 1992, in fact, the distance that the comet was from the center of Jupiter was actually well inside of the Roche limit for Jupiter. So over to the left here, you can see the calculation. Here's our equation from the previous slide. Jupiter has the density of about 1,326 kilograms per cubic meter. And comets being big, dirty snowballs, they're basically just combinations of ice and dust and stuff like that. Comets have a density that's approximately 500 kilograms per cubic meter. So if we put those in for the densities and uh, take the cube root, we find the Roche limit for Jupiter is about 3.36 times the radius of Jupiter. Well, Comet Shoemaker-Levy, when it came to its point of closest approach to light right here, was only 1.25 times the radius of Jupiter away from Jupiter. And you can see that that's well inside of this Roche limit. It's only 37% of it, in fact. So sure enough, what happened is that comet got torn apart by the tidal forces into a bunch of little fragments. And just asking you to remember one other thing that you know it, about orbits probably by this point, some of those fragments were a little bit closer to Jupiter. And as a result, they are moving more rapidly. And some of those fragments by chance would be a little bit farther away from Jupiter and they would orbit more slowly. And so not only did the comet fragment apart into pieces, but the, those fragments got stretched out into a train of fragments with the closer ones moving a little bit faster along the orbit and the larger, the ones that were farther away moving a little bit slower. So as they continued to move along this path here over the next couple of years, they stretched out into a string of fragments and almost two years later, in July of 1994, over about a six day period of time, actually, these fragments one by one crashed into uh, the upper cloud layers of Jupiter and made some easily visible, actually through telescopes, some easily visible uh, you know, marks uh, within the upper atmospheric layers of Jupiter. 
as it turns out, the, the orientation of all of this, I put an arrow here to show that the Earth, that when all this happened, was you know, basically in this direction toward the lower left of the screen. And so we actually had a pretty good view of this taking place from the Earth when those fragments crashed into it. So tidal forces can be obviously can be quite strong, and uh, in this case, strong enough to rip a com comet apart into more than a dozen uh, fragments. My last example is uh, the rings of Saturn. And so all of the outer planets, Saturn, uh, Jupiter, uh, Uranus, and Neptune, they all have ring systems, but the one that is you know, uh, most easily visible is Saturn. Um, we recognize it when we see a picture of it by its rings. If we do the same calculation of what's the Roche limit for Saturn, putting in its density, it is, uh, Saturn is much less dense, it turns out, 687 kilograms per cubic meter. And then uh, what I've used as the density of our object here is a typical um, outer solar system moon, which might have a density of around 1200 or so, uh, because uh, moons in the outer part of the solar system are largely ice, but they have some metal and rock in them as well. So they're a little bit more dense than a comet would be. And if we calculate the Roche limit in that case, it's about two times the radius of Saturn. So anything that's inside of twice the radius of Saturn, okay, would be subject to tidal forces that would be big enough to either pull it apart, as we saw in the previous case, um, or that may be one thing that happened to produce Saturn's rings is that some moon strayed inside of the Roche limit and the tidal force destroyed them by pulling them apart. Or maybe the material when the solar system formed, perhaps the material that was in orbit around Saturn because it was inside of the Roche limit was never able to coalesce into moons because the tidal forces were strong enough that they kept those fragments from uh, condensing into moons with inside the Roche limit. So it turns out if you look at them, the rings, most, not all of them, but most of the rings of Saturn actually lie within this uh, distance here, this Roche limit. And all of Saturn's large moons uh, lie well outside of this distance. So those are a few of the uh, effects of some tidal forces and um, how the tidal forces originate in the first place. There's much, much more to be investigated here. And um, you certainly, I think, now have the tools to be able to maybe investigate some other effects of tidal forces on your own. But I hope that you found this uh, interesting and useful and in some way connected with what you've been looking at in class. Thank you so much for your attention. It's been a great pleasure.